Good morning, Scottsville Christian Church. This is uh, the video that we are doing to uh, put on the website for the day of Pentecost. Uh, it came to my attention this last week that we had gone through this pandemic during this time. And goodness, we, we missed Resurrection Sunday. We missed that whole weekend. And, and everything's moved, it seems so fast. Uh, but it's been 50 days since uh, Resurrection Sunday. So uh, instead of doing our normal Bible book of the month and, and preaching out of uh, Psalms, we are going to be talking a little bit from the book of Acts. So if you would, uh, get your book of Acts and, and open it up. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Now, there will be an actual different Pentecost sermon at church as well. So uh, this one is just for specifically the uh, uh, setup for you all online. And so there will be two. And then next week, the one that we have that we're doing on today at church will be actually presented onto the website. So you're going to get a double dose of Pentecost. And uh, my sermon title is pretty simple. It's Why Pentecost? Why did we have this great day of Pentecost? And uh, first of all, I want to give a little of the background from the book of Acts and on the book of Acts. It was written by, uh, best we can understand, by the doctor, the physician, Luke. Uh, he was writing to Theophilus. Uh, that is kind of a, a question. We don't really know exactly who he was, but uh, two things. It could have been a, a Greek uh, person who was a wealthy, uh, maybe a, a ruler or some in Rome, or there was actually a uh, man who was at one point the high priest named Theophilus. And I did not know that until uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, I uh, came across that in, in a class and, and some research. So that was kind of amazing to me. He may have been writing this to Theophilus, a high priest in the Hebrew culture, and the Hebrew nation to explain to him who Jesus was and all the things along with the Gospel of Luke that he was giving as a research man. He was a, a great theologian and a man who was a, uh, a great researcher. And uh, he goes down with, Je with Josephus as one of the greatest of the, the people who actually have researched the, the time period. So... Luke was, was a fascinating writer, good, uh, great man of God. This morning, I want to talk to y'all, uh, take you back in time to a day when the world actually learned of its final instructions for the church. And uh, the Lord had actually died. He had resurrected. There were about 40 days prior to this that he was walking with the, the disciples and now the apostles. Uh, they had just uh, become apostles. They had been given a new status and now they were the leaders of the church. Uh, the Jews had began their day at sunset of the day before the Sabbath. So uh, that began on Friday evening at sundown. So it turned... Uh, in turn, it began a seven-week period of harvest, okay, from the day of Passover, that Passover Sabbath to the day of Pentecost would have been 50 days after the day of the Sabbath, which brings us to that subject of Pentecost. Now, some, uh, back in my original question, why Pentecost, and this is uh, Jewish tradition says that you would have read a man's will exactly 
50 days after his death. So his last will and testament would have been read 50 days after his death. And ironically, penta means 50. It was literally 50 days after Jesus died that his will, his last will and testament was being read. So what Peter is doing as he stands in the temple that day is reading the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. The word Pentecost is actually a Greek word and it signifies a 50th part of a thing or a 50th in an order. And this word eventually came to have a uh, technical meaning and referring to one of the feasts of the Jews. Uh, the feast had actually had three other names as well. Uh, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the Harvest, and the Feast of the First Fruits. The law of Moses required that three feasts or festivals be attended by uh, the Jewish people every year. And the Feast of Passover, and it was a feast to commemorate the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. The Feast of Pentecost uh, was much like our modern day Thanksgiving for all that God had blessed them with that year. Uh, it also reminds us of the harvest of the first fruits. So remember that, that idea of being the first fruits is Jesus was considered the firstborn of God in the first fruits and him being the first of many in the church. Then there was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, this was actually celebrated after the harvest and had began gathering things in, and it was called the Feast of the Ingathering as well. Uh, the focus on this week was to get the Jewish people to remember that 40 years in the wilderness when they had to dwell in tents. And it was a period of preparation for the entering of the promised land. And as the choice of the Pentecost feast as the time to give the Lord's will, it was actually the most participated feast in the entire Jewish calendar. So people would actually have come from across the seas and it was actually the easiest time to travel in those days. Uh, the, the waters were actually a, a, you know, the easiest time to travel during that period. It was a great you know, uh, time for them to be able to get up and move. They would go into the cities. Uh, you know, they were coming into Jerusalem specifically to you know, already bring in their harvest to start with and sell some things and also to be able to give to the temple. So as for the present uh, on this day, nearly everyone in the Jewish world would have been present at that feast. If, that, if it was at all possible, okay? So there were a lot of people who were there. Uh, read with me in Acts chapter two and verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, talking about the, the apostles, and they had already replaced Judas and with Matthias, and now it's, it's, you know, it's moving on. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, disturbing, uh, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men of every nation under heaven at this point. Luke writes that they were together, meaning the apostles specifically. Last verse of the chapter one tells us that they're all together in one place, specifically the apostles. They pooled their wisdom, they drew lots, they found Matthias to be worthy, and now we have all 12 of the apostles. Next week when you see the sermon from church today, you'll understand where all that came about, okay? Because I'm gonna talk about that next week or in the sermon next week online. But as for verses one through five, like to, uh, I like to explain it away. 
the kids, I used to tell them, you know, the fire, flaming tongues from Taco Bell, right? You know, they had a little bit too much hot sauce, you know. But these things literally sat on their shoulders. We don't know exactly what happened. You know, there's some imagery that, that's out there, some different pictures and stuff, and some, some drawings of these flaming, you know, fiery tongues. And they look uh, literally like a tongue that is the back of its own fire and it's sitting on top of their shoulders or up on top of their heads or, or whatever. But it's, it's really kind of interesting. We don't really know exactly what this was or how it had happened. But it was an interesting thing. And this kind of takes me back to that idea that I really, really hope and pray that when I die, that there's this giant movie theater in heaven and I get to sit and watch how this stuff happened because I want to interact. I want to be able to see how this stuff came about because I am one of those that I say curious minds want to know, right? Inquiry minds. And I really want to see how this had come to place. But these tongues were representing of the Holy Spirit falling on these men that Jesus had trusted in the most. And I believe that tradition may be accurate in that the apostles were probably spread out over the temple uh, preaching. They're all telling everybody about Jesus and who he was. But Peter would have been the main speaker of this group. And Peter being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit at that time, he stood toe to toe with the men who had just 50 days before this been the ones who stood before Pilate yelling the horrible words to crucify him. These were the very men who at Passover demanded Jesus be crucified. The same ones. Now, Peter it took a lot of nerve, but he begins to explain in that moment was the fulfillment of the scriptures of the book of Joel of what was happening. You know, this was all going crazy. They're, they're preaching and, and they're hearing these people speaking in tongues. They're really kind of crazy. These men are all from Galilee. And, and if you go on to read, it'll tell you, that, well, these men are from Galilee and, and yet we're hearing this gospel message from them, they're speaking in our mother's dialect. Uh, in fact, I'll explain a little bit more in detail next week. But it's fascinating. They're hearing it in their own, their own tongue. The miracle of tongues was actually in the ear. It wasn't in the mouth of the apostles they weren't speaking gibberish and blah, 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 or whatever the way they do in our modern, you know, apostolic or Pentecostal churches. What they were doing was speaking Galilean. They were speaking in their own language, but the people were hearing the gospel message from Peter and the apostles in their own tongue, in their own dialect, their mother's dialect, the language that they had learned as a child when they were first brought up, reared up as children. Okay? Fascinating how this had happened. But Peter begins to explain to them because they're freaking out. They're thinking, well, these men are drunk. You know, they're, they're out here and they've been drinking or something. What in the world's going on? They're, they're you know, crazy. What's going on here? Peter says, no, no, this is halfway through the day. We're not drunk. What, what's happening here is what the scriptures teach in the book of Joel. And he begins to, to preach to them and teach them from the scriptures. Fascinating. He teaches what is modern day present in his day from the Old Testament scriptures. He breaks it down from the book of Joel and tells them this is what's happening. This is the fulfillment of the beginning of this prophecy. And Peter yells out the words of Joel, and I'm sure you could have heard a pin drop at that time, right? I mean, it had to have been a, an amazing period. 
But this was literally a judgment on the nation of Israel. That particular scripture he was reading was literally Joel judging Israel. It was God coming down on Israel for the sin of the world that they had done. Think about that for a minute. The first gospel message that had ever been preached, the very first sermon, was preaching judgment on the people. Peter, speaking boldly through the Spirit, says this. He says in verse 22 through 24, let me find it here. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs in which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan. Ah, there's a plan. And foreknowledge of God. You, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it's impossible for him to be held in its power. Whew. Peter reminds them to remember the great things that Jesus had done. And then in verse 23, he informs them that this is the man that they had all been waiting for, the Messiah. And you, and he's pointing at them, standing probably up on some pedestal somewhere, you know, some perch, some pulpit in the middle of all this. He's raised himself up, he's elevated, and he's poured out, you, Men of Israel, the ones who are standing before me, you nailed him to the cross by the hands of ungodly men. And you put him to death. Have I got your attention? Right? <laughs> oh my, can you imagine? This is a, a crowd of, of men who had the courage to, you know, put this man, to Jesus, to death. And, and Peter stands boldly. But Peter fills him in on the plan that had been in place from the beginning of time. And he begins to share the good news that death is no longer the enemy. Jesus put that down. Peter begins now to tell them that this Jesus, the great king, is greater even than the great king David. Who's, he's in the grave still here on this earth, but not Jesus. He rose out of his grave. He's gone. David's still here. He was just a man. But Jesus, he's the son of God. He tells the men what they had done. And then in verse 36, therefore all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, being Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus and whom you had just crucified 50 days ago. And now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter 
and the rest of the apostles' brethren, what shall we do? This Jesus in whom you crucified is Lord in Christ. And right then, that very moment, they finally got it. They realized they killed God. They killed the Son of God. Jesus was the man they had been waiting for all this time. Brothers, <laughs> the whole tone changed. They went from, oh, who do you think you are? To, oh no. Brothers, we did it. Now what do we do? They had murdered the Son of God. Imagine that what had to be going through their minds. Every man, woman, and child that had witnessed Jesus carry that cross down the Via Della Rosa. Imagine the very men standing before Peter and the apostles that day were the ones who struck Jesus in the face, who spit on him as he passed by while he carried that cross. Imagine the pain that they had to be feeling at this very moment when they realized the Bible says they were pierced to the heart. What do we do, brothers? We know what we did and we were wrong and we're, we're repenting. We believe. We've heard the word. We believe. And we're repenting. What do we do? What do we do? Peter, at that very second, looks him in the face, every one of them as he passes by, and they're all head down and, and looking to the ground and ashamed of what it is that they've done. And Peter begins to read the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Peter said to them, verse 38, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's real simple. You hear the word, you believe it, you repent. You turn from your sinful ways, turn back to God, and you repent and you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift is the indwelling gift. God comes out of heaven and puts a piece of himself inside of you to become a part of him. He becomes a part of us. We are now one in Christ Jesus. I want you all to know we're all guilty. Every one of us, just as these men were. We are all guilty of sin. 
We've all fallen short of the glory of God, every one. And just as those men were as guilty as sin of putting Jesus on that cross, they yelled, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. Guess what? That blood's on us as well. At the point when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and enter into that watery grave of baptism, His blood be on us. It's a fact that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls gave their lives to Jesus and they were saved, the Bible says. <laughs> the church was born that day. It was the first day of the new covenant, the new law. The second law is what it's sometimes called, was born. Now, I, I want to explain the first law when Moses came down the edge of that mountain in Sinai, he brought down the Ten Commandments that God had written with his finger and put into the stones. And he put down the, you know, love Lord God, right? And don't sin, don't do that, don't murder, right? As we have had seen this last week. And don't steal, as we've seen this last week. Don't lie, don't covet, don't covet target right? Like we've seen this last week, the things at Target that you can't afford. Don't covet the things at the Dollar Tree that we're in here robbing and stealing. You know, those things that, that we are looting in places all over this country right now. You know, we wonder why we, we have all this stuff going on. We shut the church down for three months and have nobody telling these people how to live their lives as godly people. And they will wonder why they act like heathens. The first law. 3,000 people died. Because Moses threw that law down. Busted it up. Because they were worshiping the calf. Remember that? That was the first law. The second law. 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. The Old Testament law wasn't worthy. It was okay. It was good. It was godly. God gave it. It was, it was a wonderful thing. But Hebrews tells us we have a better covenant in Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost, our covenant was given to us that was a better covenant. So we went from death, a covenant of death and pain and sin to a covenant of love, compassion, and forgiveness. We're lost because we turn away from God but God found his way and turned a horrible day around and gave it back. If you have never submitted to his will and have been buried in the watery grave of baptism to rise and walk in newness of life, as Paul tells us, there's a way out for you. It, it means changing who you are. You know what happens a lot of times? I found people struggle with coming to Jesus and making this decision because they don't want to change. They think they're okay. I'm a good person. Well, you might be a good person in the world standards. 
but every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. One sin is all it takes, and you're a sinner. One. If you've ever told a lie, you're a liar. If you've ever stolen even a Tootsie Roll, you're a thief. If you've ever disrespected your parents, you've dishonored your parents and you broke covenant. If you've ever made an agreement with somebody and didn't follow through, you committed adultery. Yeah, that's not always a sexual thing. If you've ever worshipped the money over God or you know, put other gods, you know, we worry about Thor and, and you know, Odin and the Greek gods and all these different things. And we, you know, we, we see these kind of things and, and our world worships things now more like money and stuff, jobs, right? We have a society right now that worships our children. Instead of worrying about our children being godly people, we want to be friends with our kids instead of disciplining our children. We want to be their friends. That's not what God tells us that we're to do. We don't want to make changes in our lives because we think we're good people. We're good enough. Good enough to go right to hell. That's okay. If that's what you want, that's okay. More power to you. God says that's your choice to make that decision. And he has done everything he can to give that opportunity to you. He died on a cross so that you would have the opportunity to live. So when you take your last final breath here on this earth, you open your eyes in paradise. God has given that gift to us. The question is, are you willing to accept it? I have told you in this short time that we've been together, the gospel message, Jesus, who was God on a throne, gave up his place in glory for a time that he came as a man, lived a sinless life. He was baptized to show us the path that we're supposed to take. He gave us his last will and testament through Peter, who was given the keys to the kingdom. God said, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys. Whatever you lose here on earth will be bound in heaven. So what Peter told these men on that day of Pentecost, when he read Jesus' last will and testament, is bound in heaven. You better repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because when the angels come to reap, they only know to put you in the storehouse by that gift of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have God dwelling in you, you don't belong to Him. You're not one of His. That's the circumcision that is given without hands. Jesus said, if you're not baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can't even look upon heaven. You must be born again. My question for you all is simple. Who's next?
I got a little video that I'm going to put with this of two people last week who made that decision. They came forward, came up here, and they were baptized. I, I made a mistake. I, I thought at the time I had visited, I thought they were married, they're, they're engaged. Chris McIntosh and Tina Ledbetter. Wonderful, wonderful people who want dearly to be godly people have given their lives over to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to be praying for them. They've already been attacked this week. In the name of Jesus, they have already lost a job and probably a home. Boy, the devil doesn't waste a bit of time. But let me tell you something. His heart when he told me, I don't care. I am not giving up my Lord. Folks, I'm so blessed to be a part of that. If you've never made that decision for yourself, I want you to grab on to this understanding of who Jesus is this idea of Pentecost. Why Pentecost? Because this is the last will and testament. It is so important that we understand this because your eternity depends on it. That's why. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise you I lift you up and I love you, Lord, with all my heart. I praise you that you were willing to give your son Jesus to die on that cross, to give himself up. I know he loved us and it was his choice. But Father, I don't know that I could let my son die for another person that I knew was a sinner, Lord, and was evil in life but you did. You and Jesus put all of us together before the beginning of time. You had it all planned out. You even say, right in your scriptures, the plan of God was laid out. It's here. You're dwelling here in this place, Lord. Lift us up. Give us strength as a church to bless those around us, Lord. Build us up that we might energize this entire community with your gospel. I pray, Father, that you will give us all that we need to be able to minister to this community. God, I ask these things in Jesus' holy name, amen. This is Chris, and he has made a decision that he is ready to ask God to be a part of his life. Chris, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that you might receive forgiveness of your sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Put your hand over your nose. beat her to the punch and I've already baptized a couple of her kids but she always said that if you ever did this she wanted me to do it and 
I am so proud to be able to, to make this come true for her. But her husband is going to help me. Since he is a now new baby Christian, he has the opportunity to be able, as a royal and holy priest, to be able to uh, help to assist with this baptism as well. So Tina, upon your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that you might receive forgiveness of your sin and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're just going to come. Put, he's going to put his hand there. You ready? We're going to take you back. Who's next? 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 Who's next?